Aspect of Occultism by Dion Fortune Narrated by Matthew Schmitz 2. Sacred Centers For lead and tin are not produced from the earth. It is a fountain that produces them, and an angel stands therein. The Book of Enoch I don't think that it will be disputed that certain places exert a powerful influence on human beings. Egypt seems to be the best known one, for most people return from there having had an experience of some kind. It is said that this is caused by the electricity generated by the ever-moving sands of the Great Sahara Desert, which so changes the normal rate of vibration that an extension of consciousness is the result. This must, naturally, depend upon the individual. A purely material person would be affected in a very different way from one who is psychic. Unfortunately, we are seldom given the ordinary man's experience, which might, in many cases, be of more interest and use to humanity than the vague visionings of the psychically inclined. In every country, there are these centers, but unfortunately, since the Christian era, they have been appropriated by the church, and some of the most vital have been prefixed by the title of saint, when perhaps the influence exerted might not be at all of saintly character. Thus, the old name, that might have given a clue to the particular influence, is submerged, and in this way, much of the ancient lore is lost, because the church recognizes only one kind of experience, that of the purely religious ecstasy, which is the most emotional and primitive, and therefore, to the ordinary mind, the most wonderful, for it is a state of intoxication, and is therefore a purely selfish and personal experience, entirely to do with individual development along a particular line, and from the physical point of view, is nearly always abortive, because undirected. I emphasize the physical effect, because what its mysteries are on another plane, or state of consciousness, one can only dimly sense, or understand the effect on the journeyings of the soul. There is little, if any, guidance given by the church to those who open these doors, for it is not given to all to experience the higher religious emotion, and instead of a readjustment of values, a further vision or extension of consciousness and a breaking through some of the veils of matter, the effect is, as I have said, abortive, for the experience is so shattering to the untrained and unprepared mind that it disturbs the normal outlook on life. There is also another side to these experiences, and of this we hear but little. Those who enter the dark portals which lead to the dread subterranean palaces of the Klipoth, and whose way is no longer that of the normal individual, return from this journey with their bias towards evil intensified. In the mystery schools, each initiate was carefully watched and guided so that the experience should not be lost or allowed to destroy instead of to reconstruct. We go to these places and are not told what kind of experience to expect beyond that it will be of a religious order or contact with nature, a vague term, and therefore we go in a negative condition of mind, with will and intellect unprepared, and so the real value is completely lost in an emotional storm. As I said before, I believe that in the old names lie the secret of the influence exerted, and these have to do with the physical, or rather the contact, that lies deep in the earth. In the magical writings, we read that each metal has its particular planet, that each human being is under the influence of a planet, and it may be that a scientific fact lies in this statement, which in the future will be explained in scientific language by scientific men. During the eclipse of the Sun in 1928, some experiments were made by a Dr. Colisco with solutions of gold, silver, lead, and tin. Pictures that were taken of these before, during, and after the eclipse showed remarkable changes in activity, indicating that the celestial phenomenon had an effect, and a very marked one, on these solutions. It would be interesting to study geologically these centers, their ancient names and qualities, apart from those attributed to them by the Church, and see if we could get at the particular energizing force, and so direct it consciously to our purpose. By working along these lines, man could cooperate with the celestial powers who have their physical focuses in the earth, and so gain much in health, power, and intellect. In every country is the head and heart center, or shall we say the spiritual center, and these are linked to similar centers in other countries, and sometimes form interesting diagrams. We can all spot the head center, for that is naturally the capital of the country, 
but the heart or spiritual center is more obscure and only known to comparatively few. It is quite possible that in a country there may be as many centers as there are in a human body, for a country has a definite life and soul of its own. Just to give an example on purely religious lines, the great cathedrals of England, Durham, Chester, Lincoln, Wells, Winchester, and Canterbury form the double triangle or hexagram, but these centers are very old and were the sites of pagan temples in pre-Christian times, and to recover the type of influence, one would have to seek their old names or meaning of the names. Such diverse sites cannot all exert the same influence fundamentally, though it is possible that those only in tune to Christian influences and going no deeper than that level might only contact that particular vibration. The mineral and metallic world is the oldest and densest, and in it must lie many secrets. Could we contact its consciousness, much might be discovered for the benefit of mankind. That the ancient Druids knew of the connection of planetary with physical matter is proved by their circles. In the south of England, taking Silbury Hill as the Earth, they have worked out correctly the orbs of the planets in relation to it, the orbit of Venus being the circle of stones at Winterbourne Bassett. The temples of the sun and moon are just north of the hill, the orbit of the sun encircling it. The orbit of Mars is at Marsden, the orbit of Mercury at Walken Hill, of Jupiter at Easterly Camp, and that of Saturn at Stonehenge. There are also the seven churches in Ireland, the five churches of Stouting, Kent, though tradition tells of seven, and there are many others. These were all pagan temples. When St. Augustine wrote in AD 597 to Pope Gregory for advice concerning the many pagan places of worship he found, the answer he received was, to use them when possible, in order that the people may the more familiarly resort to the places to which they have been accustomed. All over the United Kingdom are these places, for the Druids built nothing without knowledge, and one hopes that an endeavor will be made to recover their ancient wisdom, the proof of which is so ably put forth in Mr. Lewis Spence's Mysteries of Britain. I am convinced that they had some method of contacting the great subconscious of the world, where the past, present, and future lie ready to be unfolded. That their training was a long and arduous one is certain, for that an ordered training does develop powers latent in everyone is provided by those who have been fortunate enough to be in touch with a teacher who was also an initiate and initiator. But I am sure that not only the teacher, but the time and place are to be taken into account. We walk in this wonderful world of ours as if we were not of it, but a creation apart. But we are the world, and have within our bodies every part of it, and therefore must be affected by all that concerns it. The magnetic qualities of its stone and mass of metals, the generating life of animal and vegetable matter, all play their part. But could we bring our intellect to help us, I feel sure that we could attain a result beyond our expectations. The magician of old had to work in secret, for he was more or less an outcast, unless he allied himself with others, such as the Druid did, and later the Rosicrucians, so forming a strong body. The modern magician specializes and is a freelance. Men like those who have attained such tremendous speed in the air, doctors and men of science with their microscopes and electrical appliances, all these are trained occultists and far on the path to adeptship. They are highly trained specialists and efficient parts of a whole, which, united, will bring to us knowledge of the world we live in, for they have reached an extension of consciousness far beyond that of the ordinary man, and their training has been as hard as, if not harder, than that of their predecessors of old. Sacred Centers 2 Other sheep have I that are not of this fold. John 1016 there are many planes interpenetrating our world, inhabited by beings like and yet unlike ourselves, invisible and unknown to each other and to man. This is due to their different rates of vibration. I will give a very crude example, that of the electric fan. When revolving slowly, its propellers are seen distinctly, increase its rate, and nothing is seen but a blur. This example only holds with regard to one sense, namely that of sight, but intensify and extend to all senses in an ascending and descending scale, and we could imagine how several cycles of life could, at the same time, occupy the same space, unknown to each other. That will also show the reason why different people have such diverse experiences at the same place, and in psychometry with the same object. 
We all have our own particular rate of vibration, so that every one of us must be in close tune with one at least of these elemental ratios, and it is possible that the day may come, indeed may not be so very far distant, when, by an act of will, we shall be able to change our own ratio to that of whatever cycle of life we wish to contact. That such a thing will be possible in the future is foreshadowed in an article by Professor Lowe, where he says in regard to telepathy that, Thought is an electrical process and must be capable of transmission. It may be centuries before we are able to effect the transmission, but it is certainly bound to come. So that in the future we may actually, and with all our senses, be aware of these denizens of a hitherto unknown and invisible world. It is unlikely that man should be the only form of life to be attracted to the source of energy that is generated in these places, but that other beings would also, and for the same reason, seek them. There are in this world many tides of varying length, which are called in Eastern terminology, tatwas, and these range in length from thousands of years to a few minutes. The greater ones we are only aware of by looking back on the rise and fall of civilizations and the changes on the face of the globe. These are under the dominion of one of the great northern constellations, but there are many lesser ones, and to these we can attribute the falling into disuse some of our centers and the gradual reopening of others. In the last hundred years or so, there has been the uncovering of many buried cities and even great civilizations with their many gods and creeds. Whenever a place has had prayers and concentrated desires directed towards it, it forms an electrical vortex that gathers to itself a force, and it is for a time a coherent body that can be felt and used by man. It is round these bodies of force that shrines, temples, and in later days churches are built. They are the cups that receive the cosmic downpouring, focused on each particular place. There is very little teaching on these matters, and I think it advisable now to speak of the dangers that may be encountered from the lesser known and more primitive psychic centers. That there was a danger was recognized by the Druids and Romans, for they raised altars and offered sacrifices to these woodland peoples, and it was an act of propitiation, for if you don't give, they take, and what they take is unfortunately something that you cannot spare. It is life force, for they seek ever to come closer to man, to mingle with him, and to take on his ratio, for it is said therein lies their hope of immortality. Should we wish to help these sheep of another fold, we can do so by a wish to understand their needs and by bringing to them a knowledge of the finer details of our later times, and in that way, the sacrifice need not be one that is hurtful to our health or sanity. We must remember, however, that they are of an older and more elemental race, that they belong to another country, and that their laws are quite different, so that we might be seriously injured in mind and body by such encounters, for our bodies are not adapted to bear the brunt of the violent impact of those who differ in almost every way from ourselves. It is said that there are fairy marriages, but these can only happen between those whose ratio is the same, but therein generally lies sadness and heartbreak, unless entered into with understanding. Pan and his fellows are still to be seen and heard, though these encounters are not so spectacular as story would have us believe, and are generally disagreeable and frightening, and not to be encouraged or wished for. We may enter these unknown regions lightheartedly, but to get away from them and rid oneself of unpleasant attachments is not easy, and help is not always at hand when required.